Alrighty, welcome to another episode of the Ever After Crafter, starring me, Andrea Redlin. I'm just going to jump right into it. Today, we are going to learn how to clean and fill three different types of fountain pens. Oh yeah! First one is a eyedropper fountain pen, which I will explain the different types later. And then we have a piston fill pen, which is rather fun to fill. Not so much fun to clean, though. And third, we have your basic cartridge pen, and this one's very special because it has a Triforce symbol on it! Yay! I am a Legend of Zelda fan. Die hard. I'll show you again, because I am a show-off. Ha <laughs> ha! So, the first thing we're going to do is get our supplies. We got paper towels, we got a bowl, we got our ink, of course, because you can't just fill a fountain pen with water. And then we have a glass jar, which... It doesn't have to be glass, but it has to be heavy enough to keep your pens from falling and tipping over. And then we have a very useless paintbrush. Then we have the Goulet ink syringe, which I love. This thing is indispensable when it comes to cleaning and filling the fountain pens. And I will link the, this in the description below. And so without further ado, we will get started. So I'm going to assemble the ink syringe. And yes, I'm recording this as a voiceover because the sound on my camera stinks. So, and it's hotter than hell in this attic. So, here we go. Now the ink syringe is used to, surprise, surprise, suck up the ink and also inject it into either a fountain pen cartridge or the barrel of your eyedropper fountain pen. So the first thing I'm going to do is fill this bowl with water and I'm going to kind of keep the water running. One, because it's just for the purposes of this video, and because I'm going to be cleaning three fountain pens. So the first thing you want to do is disassemble your fountain pen. This is the eyedropper one. I have this pretty ring on here just because I like to decorate my pens and I'm just weird like that. And as you can see, I haven't cleaned this one in a while, so... And not many pens are this complicated, but... Um, this is an Ahab, a Noodler's Ahab Flex Pen. So I'm going to keep the water running. The Hubster's not going to like it, but he doesn't watch my channel, so he will never know. So, we're going to unscrew the barrel of the pen, and you will want to give it a good rinse, and then just kind of let it sit in there and soak for a while. That's why we're doing this one first. And some pens, the nibs come out, in this case this one does, it takes a little struggle, and it comes apart in three pieces. Like there's like the barrel thing, then there's the ink feeder, and then there's the little metal tip, which is the nib itself, that's N-I-B. So blink, let those soak for a while. Yes, your hands will get inky in this endeavor, but that's what makes it so much fun. So you're just gonna be rinsing out all your pieces and you know that little useless brush I told you about before? Well, that's going to come in handy for these, or a bottle brush, but you want it to be very gentle because sometimes, you know, if you're using an older pen, it's made of celluloid, you don't want to damage it. But those really useless kids' brushes, these are great for scrubbing out your pen parts. So, scrubby, scrubby, scrub, and rinse, 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 and I am going to be skipping most of the scrubbing and rinsing so you don't get bored to death. There we go, skipped. So... You're going to want to scrub these parts until you get the ink off. Um, this pen in particular, it started off as being clear, but it has stained over time from heavy usage. Scrub it! Scrub it, woman. So, make sure everything is clean. You want the water to kind of run clear. But you're never going to get all the color out of these. There's just no way. So, make sure your water is clear. And then we will be moving on to the second pen, which is the piston fill pen. So if you want, you can leave these soaked. Sometimes I'll just put them in a bowl of lukewarm water and just let them soak for an hour. But for the purposes of this video, I'm just, you know, letting them soak during the video. And you want to use lukewarm water, no soap, nothing. Just a little lukewarm water. Now this is the piston fill pen, which is really easy to fill. Blink. And you, these are relatively a bit easier to disassemble and reassemble. See, it's got a piston right there. Isn't it cute? And I like these because also, like the other one, it allows you to see how much ink 
is in there. So this one is a twist and piston. See, so you twist it and it it pushes out the ink or sucks the ink back up depending on which direction you're twisting it in. I believe righty is sucky and lefty is squirty. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, you're gonna twist the piston and suck up some clean water. See, like you can tell it's still dirty inside. And then shoot that water out. And then what I want you to do is just keep sucking up clean water and squirting it out until your water runs clear. And once again, I will fast forward because repetition is boring, isn't it? And periodically you might want to just, you know, rinse out that water and put clean water in, but... So, give it a couple more rinses. I forget how many times I had to do this. But I did actually skip over a few times in cutting this video together. And then once it is clean, then just set it aside and we'll be moving on to the next pen, which is the easiest. That will be the Zelda pen. Da -da -da -dum! And that will be the cartridge fill pen. Yay! Now the cartridge fill pen, it just some most of them either easily unscrew or they pull apart. And they have these nifty little ink cartridges which if you're an idiot you're going to throw it out. But since we are not idiots, we will learn how to clean them and how to refill them. So you're going to take your handy dandy ink syringe which does not have a sharp point on the needle, it's just a metal tube. You're going to suck up that water and you're going to use it to flush out all the ink, the, you know, the leftover ink from these cartridges. So flush that thing out. And then what you're, after you flush water in, you're going to want to use the syringe to suck out the dirty water because it will expedite the process of flushing and sucking. Okay, this sounds really bad. Uh, <laughs> so you want to flush out the cartridge until the water runs clear. Yes, it can get a little messy, but I guess I'm just used to it. I've been using fountain pens since I was like 13, and I will never stop using them. I, I have an article on my blog where, see how nice and clear that is, which explains the benefits of fountain pens, which I will also link below. And now that we have cleaned our fountain pens, we will move on to filling them in the same order that we cleaned them. So here we go, part two. So now we have our ink syringe comes in handy again. I've got two different colors of ink. Oh yeah, you can also clean the syringe really easily just by pulling it off. And these are totally reusable. I've had the same one for probably five years, maybe more. They get sold in two packs. And I've got two different types of ink, or two different colors of ink. And since I don't quite have enough in each bottle for all of these pens, I'm just going to wing it and blend the colors together like the artist that I am. So be really careful in taking them off. Stick that needle in there and just suck up the ink. So we got some lovely turquoise. Now you're not going to need quite this much ink when you're just filling one pen or filling one cartridge, but since I'm filling three pens and that first one has a huge capacity for holding ink, which is the eyedropper pen, you know that really dirty one at the beginning, um, that that's why there's so much ink in the syringe. <laughs> You'll see just how much ink this sucker holds. Okay, here it is. Here it is. It holds lots of ink. Now, you're going to stick the needle in and have your uh, glass jar ready because you're going to want a place to set the full pen so you don't spill it. And then you're gonna also going to want to reassemble the other parts, but I'll show you that later. So, stick the needle down and do not fill it all the way. You're going to want to leave a probably like a half inch air bubble or a quarter inch air bubble just leave an air bubble because if you don't you're gonna get the ketchup bottle effect where you know how you turn that ketchup bottle upside down you smack the crap out of it but because there's no air bubble in there the ketchup won't come out well the same thing is is the same with the ink so set that aside and now we're going to reassemble the pen and of course oh, stuck it in the wrong end I do that a lot in this video I don't know why so you're going to want to line up your ink feeder with your nib in this particular model of pen. Again, that's the Noodler's Ahab Flex Pen. 
and it's an eyedropper and it also happens to be a uh, um, piston converter pen so and it the pieces go into this little groove I don't know if you can see that yeah there's the groove I found it so that just gets wedged in there and you'll be able to see the ink actually flow through this there is also an o-ring there I don't know if you can see that which is to prevent leaks but uh, I keep forgetting to put that grease on it so mine tends to leak so screw it back on and your pen is now ready for writing and when you want to write with it you might want to hold it point down for a little bit just until the ink comes out on the paper but always store your fountain pen point up or you're gonna have a lot of leaks on your hands so there my pen is now pretty again and the next one is going to be uh, the piston fill pen now I have shot all this ink back into the bottle because you're gonna want a a little bit of a deep bit of ink because you want to put that whole nib in there in order for this pen to fill you got to stick the whole nib in see when I twist that piston see I didn't submerge the nib all the way so because I didn't tilt the bottle enough so we're gonna stick that back in and then tilt the bottle stick the whole nib in and then hopefully we'll get some ink there we go there's a little bit I'm not gonna try to put it and then just wipe it off on a paper towel and reassemble your piston fill pen oh this one is a Dryden by the way that's d-r-y-d-e-n it's the Dryden dangerous red is the color and it's a it's a pretty good pen next is my beautiful amazing Zelda fountain pen which I found at GameStop as part of a journal set and this is like this will take you like 20 seconds to do so fill your cartridge just like you did with the other one leave that air bubble in there folks or your pen is going to give you problems see that air bubble leave it there and then just pop it back into your pen I mean really that's like the the cartridge pens are great for beginners because they're so easy to refill and re and clean out especially if you have that ink syringe in fact before I had the ink syringe I was spending way more money on new cartridges and those cost way more than an ink syringe so don't forget to put your ink back in the bottle in this case I'm going to have a blended color along with stinky inky fingers so that's about all I have to show you for this video today don't forget to stay tuned for an excerpt of my humor book, which is called Life is Short, So Lick the Bull, available on Amazon in both ebook and print formats. It's called Life is Short, Short, Short So Lick the Bull. And because this is a crafting channel, I finally decided, um, you know, maybe I should read the chapter on crafters. Yeah, I think that might be a good idea. So, thank, don't forget to like, subscribe, thank you for watching, don't forget to wash your hands, ink does come off, sort of, eventually. So, stay tuned and you will watch that clip. Or listen to that clip. Sorry! Hoo -hoo. It's really hot up here. So much for sticking around this long I know I can run on for a little bit anyway thank you for hanging around for to hear the excerpt of my book the excerpt is called cheapskate craft show shoppers which if you've ever done a craft show I'm sure you can relate to people trying to uh, you know talk your prices down when you know your stuff is worth a lot so I think you'll enjoy this I hope so Anyway, Chapter 12, Cheapskate Craft Show Shoppers from Life is Short, So Lick the Bowl. Now, when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s, Mom and I spent much of our spare time making things, mainly because we were too poor to enjoy entertainment like movies and vacations. By the time I hit my early teens, we were able to make some money on the side selling our creations. Because of this upbringing, I never stopped creating. 
and I never stopped trying to earn a few dollars here and there, so I suppose in a way, I'm grateful for growing up broke. Thanks, Mom. Sadly, the art and craft market has declined more than my health when I go two months without exercise. In the late 90s, it was so easy to make money selling at craft shows, but fast forward to now, and you'll find that people would rather pay for cheap knockoffs that fall apart rather than support local artisans and other craftspeople who put in hours of work and dedication. Here's a quick example. If I've invested, I don't know how many hours, you know, 20, 30 hours, knitting a sweater out of cotton, high quality yarn, and asking 75 to $90 for it, people complain because they'd rather go to a store and pay 15 to $20 for an imported machine knit acrylic sweater that will start to pill before its first wash. Fine then, go. I hope you enjoy that plastic sweater that won't last a year. Before all this outsourcing became mainstream, we crafters and artists, yeah, we had it pretty good. We made high quality merchandise, we charged accordingly. People were happy to fork over the cash for a handmade item because they represented or because they respected the fact that we worked very hard for that money, especially if our creations were items that could not be found in stores. Plus, it was one con once considered cool to wear or decorate with handmade items. Nowadays, not so much. Unfortunately, this is decorating with handmade items is hardly the case anymore. Even for we artisans whose tastes range into the more unusual end of the spectrum, such as blacksmithing, paper making, calligraphy, soap making, and spinning. Yes, I actually do know how to make paper, and since you've been watched, clearly been watching this video, calligraphy, I know how to make homemade soap, and I do spin my own yarn, which you will see in probably the next couple videos. In this world of mass produced items, I feel we owe it to our ancestors to at least try one of the old forgotten skills that used to be a regular part of our survival. We'd be a lot more illiterate, stinky, and colder than we are now if our ancestors hadn't learned and perfected some of the above-mentioned art forms. So when you see a hand-knit sweater at a craft show, buy it. It's worth the price in blood, sweat, and yarn tangles. It angers me to no end when I see people accusing us of charging too much for our products that we've sacrificed many hours of our personal time on time that we will never get back. More often than not, these are the same people who charge up hundreds of dollars on their department store credit cards whenever they hit the local mall. Yet they seem to have a problem with giving an artist a fair price for his or her work, just because that person is not a store or a well-known name brand. This is crap, and there have been countless times in which people have refused to buy my merchandise simply because they thought I was charging too much. In actuality, I charge less than most artists, but not according to one woman I encountered one afternoon. Ho ho ho, wait till you meet her. A few years ago on a beautiful day with a cloudless blue sky, you know, those really nice days that are easily ruined, my husband and I had set up our selling table at the local flea market. That's where I, ironically, that's where I met him. You know, apparently you could find anything at the flea market, even spouses. My husband was selling various bits of junk from our apartment while I was trying to get rid of about 50 handmade necklaces, averaging about 5 bucks a piece. A drop in most people's buckets, really. Even for broke folks, like me. I spent a few hours knitting the time away, only stopping when people came to the table, or when I had to pee. You know, it's astounding how much fluid you can put away when you're sitting in the sun slowly roasting under a beach umbrella. We also seem to run out of food, even if we do bring enough soggy tuna fish sandwiches to feed a family of sharks. After cramming down a few fishy sandwiches and spending one glorious uninterrupted hour knitting several several rows of a sock that would eh, probably never meet its match, she appeared. The woman who had ruined many a vendor's afternoon with her poisonous comments. She was pushing a stroller as she came up to our table to browse, strutting like she was hot stuff in her crop top and skin-tight white leggings that did nothing but highlight the quivering hills of cellulite on her butt. Even a blind person would have no trouble seeing it. Hello, I said, trying to be polite, trying to shield my eyes from the ten pounds of wiggling cottage cheese packed like sausage inside those white leggings. 
Miss Selluwhite, as I called her, gave something like a grunt in reply, which translates roughly in English to, Talk to me again and the cops will never find your body. I beat a hasty retreat back to my battered canvas chair that was slowly forming an imprint of my own butt, and I was thankful then that I at least knew how to dress my flab, even if I couldn't get rid of it. A little girl was traveling with Miss Sellu White, who was probably her daughter, and she admired my jewelry out loud. She was just on the verge of asking her mother if she could buy one of the necklaces when I heard something like a followed by the muttered word, EXPENSIVE! However, it wasn't so quietly uttered that my husband didn't hear it from ten feet away, and our eyes met with mutual understanding. This customer was a waste of space and a mouthy liar. Oh, it gets even worse. Miss Sally White humored her daughter and looked at the $5 necklaces that had been hand-sculpted and hand-painted by me and sneered, I'm not paying that for jewelry. Well, where do you shop for wedding rings then, I thought? The dollar store? She must have sensed my barely controlled urge to impale her on my double-pointed knitting needles because the cheapskate lady stalked off, her accentuated celluloid jiggling behind her with every step, like the two piles of cottage cheese were, I don't know, surviving an earthquake or something. That's when I decided that the name Cottage Cheeks suited her better. Half an hour later, I was on my way once again to the ladies' room. I had drunk enough bottles of blue Gatorade to make my tongue and lips appear as frostbitten as Jack Dawson's in Titanic, so you can imagine what was going on with my pea-sized bladder. I made my way down the aisle, past table after table of busy vendors trying to make a few bucks in the almost stifling heat of the early afternoon. The bathroom was in sight, but unfortunately, so was Cottage Cheeks, just ahead of me at another vendor's table. Hoping she wouldn't notice me, I slowed my pace to conceal the sound of my footsteps, and I was able to hear her conversation with the vendor regarding his price on an expensive-looking music box that the cheapskate lady was holding in her hands. I was just about to get completely clear of the table when I heard Cottage Cheeks crankily inquire about the price of the box. But before the vendor could answer her, the music box slipped through her fingers, crashed to the ground, and shattered into about 15 pieces. Well, you just bought it now, lady, said the angry vendor, and I had to bite my lip to keep my, for my triumphant laugh and my urine from escaping. Serves her right, muttered another vendor to me as I stopped to stare with other people glaring at Cottage Cheeks and her new predicament. She never buys anything unless we're selling it for free. I smiled, nodding my agreement. Apparently, this cheapskate was famous in our little community of sellers. Judging by her dress sense, she must be well known in the dairy aisle of the grocery store, too. Cottage cheese, anyone? Well, that's the end of my excerpt. I hope you enjoyed it, and hopefully you'll check out the rest of my book at my website, www.andrearedlin.com. That's Andrea with an I-A. See you guys later. Bye.